Good. So everyone, shalom, shabbat shalom. Good to be with you from Jaffa, Yafo, here uh, on the Mediterranean coast. And um, we're going to open up in a word of prayer, and then we're going to get into studying God's word. So Father God, thank you for this day. Thank you for this gathering. Thank you for your word. We bless you, Lord. We thank you for the wisdom of your word. And we ask, Lord, for divine inspiration, Lord, that you would in be, indeed be our rabbi, our teacher, our shepherd, our Lord, our savior, all of that, Lord. We thank you. We thank you for your faithfulness towards us and your love, your unchanging love. Amen. Let me just turn my camera a little bit. All right, good. So, ladies and gentlemen, we are studying this week the parashat called Balak. Balak, uh, and where our, our text is from uh, the book of Numbers, from uh, chapters 22 to 25. Um, this guy, Balak, and Balaam, we're going to look at. And um, I've entitled this. God's unchanging blessing and love. God's unchanging blessing and love. Do you remember, I think it was a couple of weeks ago when I talked about uh, Moses lifting up the serpent in the wilderness. That's what the Lord instructed him to do. The Lord didn't tell him how to do it. He just said, do it. Put the bronze, put the serpent up on a pole. And Moses put it on a bronze pole. And we talked about why the bronze, what, what led him to do that. And, uh, and perhaps it was the reflection of that bronze, the, the light reflection. They saw themselves as they looked at that serpent. They saw, uh, you know, that serpent reminded them of their mistakes, their sins. Uh, maybe it reminded them of the original sin. Um, but they saw themselves, and that was part of their repentance, their penance, as they looked at that serpent. It wasn't just a one-off, one-second gaze. It was a constant look in the mirror, as it were. But the mysterious thing that we brought out was that the very thing that caused them pain and death, God actually told them, look at it, lift it up, look at it, and it will bring you healing. What a mystery. The very thing that caused pain and death, I want you to look at it and I'm going to cause it to actually bring healing that you may live. So God was doing this real strange um, strategy plan. And uh, we're going to see another one of, if I can use baseball term, we're going to see another one of God's curveballs where he throws a ball at you. You don't know where it's coming from. And this is the story of uh, Balaam or Balak and Balaam. Now, Balak, he, he and Balaam, they are actually the central characters in today's parasha. This is one, actually, sorry, this is the only real parasha portion of the five books of Moses where the Israelites or the Lord are really not the main characters. Usually it's about the Israelites. They are the main characters. But in this one, it's, uh, it's a, an arch enemy of Israel, and that is Balak. Now, we don't know a lot about Balak, but we do know that he rose up and, uh, and he wanted to curse Israel. Okay? Let me just say a little bit about God's enemies, because we all know that God's people have enemies right from the beginning, even before pre-creation. Uh, there was uh, an enemy of God, Lucifer, who rebelled against God. And then the oldest book in the world, considered to be the oldest book in the world, the book of Job. We know what happened in that story. Hasatan, the accuser, uh, came and he provoked God to move against him. Interestingly, the name in Hebrew, Job, is Eov. That's how you say Job in Hebrew, Eov. And it's the same root word as the word enemy, Oyev. 
And in a way, that's what Job became. He became an enemy. He didn't do anything wrong, but he became an enemy. He didn't ask for it. He didn't provoke God. He became an enemy. And, um, and this is a mystery in the history, mystery in the history of uh, God's dealings with mankind, why uh, evil and why enemies rise up against God and why they rise up against God's people. Um, just a little side note, which the rabbis believe everyone, and I think it's something to think about. Uh, actually, it's not just the rabbis, it's, it's general thought that Satan always has to ask God's permission to do something against God's people. It doesn't always come out, but it comes out in the book of Job where he goes and asks permission from the Lord to attack Job. And then in Luke 22, in the New Testament, Yeshua, Jesus said, Simon, Simon, Satan has asked to sift you as wheat. And I have prayed uh, for you that your faith does not fail. When you have returned, strengthen your brethren so uh, in, in 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 judaism's thought satan satan he is just a vessel in god's hand god uses him for his purposes and plans to br to bring out his glory and of course it doesn't feel like that when you're going through a trial or a test that's the last thing you're thinking about you just want to get through it but uh, this is uh, uh, rabbinical thought, that he is just a pawn. He is just a vessel. He is actually God's servant. And I think if we can look at our enemies, and especially uh, the one who accuses the brethren day and night, as simply a servant of God, and, and if you don't agree, we can discuss this later, um, then it, it, I think it will empower us and it will take away any fear that we have of our enemy. Because I know some people are in bondage. They're afraid of the enemy. I went through many years where I was actually afraid of spiritual warfare coming under attack. And, and I think partly looking back is because I didn't really know who I was. I didn't have the, the tools. I didn't have God's word. I didn't have uh, a good self-image. I didn't have a good sense of who I am in the Messiah. Uh, and that led to a lot of fear. But knowing who Satan is, knowing more who I am, and knowing how much God is on our side, even though he allows, and this is the mystery, he's on our side, and yet he allows this enemy room to do what God wants to achieve. This is one of those, you know, fine lines of uh, friction that we have to deal with in our minds. Okay, now having said that, um, before we get into the text, I want to read just one other, one or two more passages. One is Genesis 12, the famous Lech Lecha, where God said to Abraham, Lech Lecha, get out of your home, your land, your people, and go. And I will show you the land. I will bless you. First, he says in, in Genesis 12, too, I will make you a great nation. And I will underscore the term. I will. I will bless you and make your name great. And you shall be a blessing. I will bless those that bless you and curse him that curses you. And in you shall all families of the earth be blessed. Now, guys. The, the, the term I will, the volition of the almighty, out of the blue, here's a real curveball. God chooses this man, like you and I, in Ur of the Chaldees. The word Ur is from the Hebrew word or, which means light. This was Abraham's enlightenment. He was in a very dark place. Ur, this is where many, many gods were. 
And all of a sudden, the spotlight falls on Abraham. God, out of his own volition, decides he is going to bless him. Now, what does it mean, bless? We could spend hours throwing around ideas and concepts. But in short, to me, it's something in the spiritual realm that God decides where he wants to send his favor, his love, his guidance, his protection, his we, we the list could go on and on. I, I don't know if I really have the words, bless, I will bless you. What I did say a, a month or two back is the Hebrew word bless, bracha. The word bracha is from the uh, same root word as bricha, which is a pool, a pool of water. And waters are refreshing. Waters are life-giving. And there's something about the blessing of life. For example, where I'm sitting right now, it's a beautiful day. And I could actually say, wow, it's a blessing being here. But then I could get a real visitation from the Holy Spirit. And I could say, wow, that was a real blessing. And I think there's a difference between a blessing on a, on a common level than a blessing from the Almighty, a divine move from God. And we got to believe that God does this until today. He moves. And his blessing, this Abrahamic promise over his seed and over us who are grafted in and who become heirs of that seed, that his blessing is still over us today. Okay. However, now we're going back to uh, our story. We have enemies. We have people that want to bring curse. And this is a story found in Numbers chapter 22, the portion called Balak. Now, this guy Balak, he is a king of a group of people called the Moabites. Now, the Moabites, do you remember at the Dead Sea? on the east of the Jordan. That is the land of Moab. And that is the land that the two daughters of Lot, when Sodom and Gomorrah happened, Lot and the two daughters ran into those mountains. The two daughters probably thinking there's no men left on the earth to have children. That was the common role of a woman to, have, to bear children. They got him drunk, their father, and they both got pregnant. One got pregnant to Ammon, from where we get the Ammonites, and one got pregnant and gave their ch her, her child a, a name, Moav, which means from my father, and that's where we get the Moabites. And the Moabites were a, a, a fierce, uh, wicked, uh, horrible people. And what's interesting is that the Israelites, when they came from Egypt, up the king's highway and they wanted to pass through the land of Moab, the Moabites were not very nice. And they said no. Okay? So firstly, we get this incestuous story. Secondly, we get this conflict story where the Moabites were not very friendly people. They didn't welcome the Israelites into their new promised land with a red carpet, or as in Joe Biden's case in Saudi Arabia, a purple carpet. He got, he got the purple carpet rolled out, which someone said last night at our prayer meeting, purple in that culture is an insult. I don't know if it was. I don't know if it was meant for that. Someone can look into that and, and, and update us, please. But uh, the Moabites did not welcome the Israelites. So the Israelites had to go a bit of a longer way. But... They made it into their promised land. And it says in Numbers 22, verse 2, you've got your Bibles, Numbers 22, 2. Now Balak, the son of Tipor, saw all that Israel had done to the Amorites. And, Mo, and that was, by the way, that was one of the uh, other uh, peoples that the Israelites dealt with. And Moab was exceedingly afraid because there were many and Moab was sick with dread because of the children of Israel 
So Moab said to the elders of Midian, now this company will lick up everything around us as an ox licks up the grass of the field. And Balak, the son of Zippor, was king of the Moabites at that time. Then he sent messengers to Balaam, or Balaam, the son of Beor at Pator, which is near the river in the land of the sons of the people, to call him, saying, look, a people have come from Egypt. See, they cover the face of the earth, and they are settling next to me. This is probably where we get the term settlers, right? They are settling next to me. Therefore, please come at once, curse this people for me, for they are too mighty for me. Perhaps I shall be able to defeat them and drive them out of the land. For I know that he whom you bless is blessed, and he whom you curse is is cursed. So the elders of Moab and the elders of Midian departed with the diviner's fee in their hand, and they came to Balaam and spoke to him the words of Balak. Now, guys, one of the things that is is going on here is Balak. He does not want the Israelites to settle in their land. This now, now it's an interesting question. Did Balak? know the promise of Abraham on the Israelites? It's an interesting question. Word spreads, right? Customs, cultural secrets, cultural beliefs, religious beliefs. Different cultures study other cultures' belief systems. And I would guarantee that probably the Moabites and Balak, the king of Moab, he knew the Israelites customs and belief system that there was a blessing and that there was a certain land now the second point is it's a kind of a question did Balak actually Balak Balak sorry did he actually know what he was doing meaning when he called for this curse was it just because he was afraid that they were going to maybe one day wipe him out or were there dark forces working through Balak in order to stop God's purposes? In other words, did he cognitively sit down and think, you know what? I don't want what they believe to be the promises of God to be fulfilled. I want to stand against God's word. Meaning, what, what I'm getting at, everyone, was this the spirit of anti-Christ? At work, and and by the way, another interpretation for antichrist is anti God, anti anointed one. That's what Christ means, anti anointed one, anti God, anti God's word. That's exactly the same uh, meaning. And uh, did he actually know it, or was he secondary? Was he using secondary? reasons for getting them out which was he was afraid of them that they may one day uh, snuff them out but deep down there were forces at work and the reason why i ask that question is because your president many of you joe biden he was here this week and he said a lot of good things but he's in the process of making decisions he is for a two-state solution i'm giving a, an example i don't want to get political but i'm giving an example now, is that two-state solution part of God's plan or not? We don't have to answer that now. But the point that I'm trying to make is, is he being a peacemaker? Or are there forces at work working through him? Has he opened himself up somewhere where a belief system has taken over and he is being led to make certain decisions? It's a really interesting question. Another good example is when the Lord said to Peter and the disciples, I must now go up to Jerusalem where the Son of Man will be handed over to the Romans and crucified, but on the third day he will rise. And Peter gets him aside and says, no, Lord, no. You know, probably with very good intentions, you know, probably wanted to protect the Lord, wanted to save him from the Romans, uh, really good intentions. And yet the Lord looks and says, get behind me, Satan. You do not have the things of God in mind, but the things of man. So in a way, 
Peter right then became an enemy of God. I hate to say that about Peter. Uh, at that moment, you know, I'm not saying the rest of his life. At that moment, he became a stumbling block. So some food for thought. Now, we've looked at Balak a little bit. Now, let's have a look at Balaam. Okay. Balaam was the man that was hired. In chapter 22, verse 9, we see, we start to see that this guy, Balaam, he's an interesting character. Before we go into the verses, Jewish tradition believes that he, firstly, we know he was a non-Israelite, number one. Number two, we know he was a diviner. He got his fee for that. And, and by the way, in those days, he was believed to be the greatest diviner in the world. He was kind of on the same level as someone today like, I don't know, the Dalai Lama or Nostradamus back a few centuries. Someone big, well-known, whether you ag agreed with him or not, someone big with a big voice, a big following. Uh, but in Judaism, they believe traditionally that Balaam was one of the three advisors to the Pharaoh in Egypt. They, Judaism teaches that Pharaoh had three advisors to help him against a potential Israelite plot or revolt. One was Jethro. We've already talked about how the Midianites were close to the Moabites. Jethro was the priest of Midian. So he offered spiritual counsel. So it's believed that Jethro, number two, Job, this is Juda Jewish belief, and number three, Balaam. It's taught that Jethro advised conciliation. Job, he abstained, but Balaam, advise the Pharaoh to uh, enslave the Jews in Egypt. Now, I'm not going to put all my eggs in one basket and say, I believe that. I'm just throwing out some ideas, food for thought. Maybe if someone wants to look into that and find something on that. But, uh, you know, in my experience now, more and more experience of the sages, of the rabbis, usually, sometimes they do, but usually they don't just come out with statements to be academically smart. They, they usually do research, and sometimes it's from ancient Near Eastern Mesopotamian books and writing. So anyway, I'll just leave it at that for now. However, what we do know is, number one, he's not a Jew. He's not an Israelite. Number two, he's a diviner. And number three, he was big. In fact, they say he was on the same level as Moses, as Moshe. Because it says in Deuteronomy, there was never anyone like Moses in all the days. Of course, that's before the Lord Yeshua came on the scene. But, and, and by the way, Moses himself said in Deuteronomy 18.18, 18, the Lord your God will raise up unto you one like me. Listen to him. So Yeshua is the one like Moses. And of course, the parallels, Moses was the baby that was divinely spared from being murdered. And so was Yeshua, the baby that was divinely spared from being murdered. So in chapter 22, um, uh, we're looking at, who are we looking at? We're looking at Balaam. Okay, Balaam. Uh, chapter 22, verse 9. Then God, okay, this is the Almighty here. He came to Balaam, this non-Israelite, non-Jew. And he said to him, who are these men with you? So Balaam said to God, Balak, the son of Zippor, king of Moab, has sent to me saying, look, a people has come out of Egypt and they cover the face of the earth. Come now, curse them for me. Perhaps I shall be able to overpower them and drive them out. And God said to Balaam, you shall not go with them. You shall not curse the people for they are blessed. They are blessed. Now, what happens now? Balaam goes back to Balak and he tells him. He tells him what happened. Look at verse 13 in chapter 22. So Balaam rose in the morning and said to the princes of Balak, go back to your land for the Lord has refused to give me permission to go with you. Man, talk about a good disciple. I mean, really, Balaam, he is doing exactly what we should be doing. Listening to God 
obeying God. And that's, he was a good disciple. Uh, verse 14, and the princes of Moab rose and went to Balak and said, Balaam refuses to come with us. Then Balak again, notice how the enemy doesn't give up. Okay, we all know that, but I just want to bring it out in the story. Verse 15, then Balak again sent princes more numerous and more honorable than they. And they came to Balaam and said, thus says Balak, the son of Tipor. Please let nothing hinder you from coming to me, for I will certainly honor you greatly, and I will do whatever you say to me. Therefore, please come, curse this people for me. Guys, what could be driving Balak here to curse the Israelites? What was going on in this man Balak's life? He was, he, I mean, some people would say he was demon-possessed. He was driven something was it's almost like that evil spirit that came upon Saul something was driving him here verse 18 then Balaam answered and said to the servants of Balak though Balak were to give me his house full of silver and gold I could not go beyond the word of the Lord my God to do less or more now therefore please you also stay here tonight that I may know what more the Lord will say to me now let's stop for there Balaam here Perhaps this is where he makes a mistake because the Lord had already said to him, don't curse. Okay. But notice what he says. Let's read it again. Verse 19. Now, therefore, please stay here tonight that I may know what more the Lord will say to me. He, I believe he opened the door thinking maybe God's going to change his mind, you know, and maybe it was that the, the, the seduction of the glory of the honor that started to get into Balaam's flesh. You know how you can play with an idea in your mind? You know it's wrong, but it tastes good. It's, the, it's like feeding on the tree of knowledge. It's sweet. It's tasty. It looks good. He, should have, he shouldn't have come. He shouldn't have said, stay the night. But he opened the door here, everyone. He started to, you know, compromise a little bit. Verse 20, and God came to Balaam at night and said to him, if the men come to call you, now look what God says, rise and go with them. So now he's given permission, but only the word which I speak to you, that you shall do. So Balaam, Balaam of course, he rose in the morning, settled his donkey and went with the princes of Moab. Notice the verse, he settled his donkey, okay? Because that donkey is going to play a, 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 a part in this uh, play. So Balaam is on his way. Now he's got the Lord's permission. He's got the Lord's permission to go, but not to curse. All right. Now we're up to verse 22. I think it's of chapter 22. Then God's now completely out of the blue without nothing having been done. Look what it says in verse 22. Then God's anger was aroused before he went. So first God says, don't go. Now he actually gives him permission to go. And now it says, before he went, God was angry. Have you noticed that before? And the angel of the Lord took his stand in the way as an adversary against him. And as he was riding his donkey and his two servants were with him. Okay. Now, before we go on, because we know what's going to happen, but let's just stop for a second and ask the question, why was God angry? Why did God say, don't go? And then say, okay, go. And before he went, God was angry. And this is a really interesting part of the story because, uh, and I've, I've read a lot of commentaries on this, and, and the majority of the people were saying that something probably changed in Balaam's attitude Again, he opened the door to go, and maybe before, when, uh, when uh, he first refused, Balaam was on good ground. But God, in his wisdom, he picked up something in Balaam that was unpure, unholy, unclean, bad motive. Perhaps he wanted this glory, this honor. We, don't, we can't say 100% sure, but it, all, all lights are pointing 
uh, down on it being the glory, the honor, the favor, the rewards, whatever he was going to get. And what happened? Look at verse 23. Now, the donkey saw the angel of the Lord standing in the way. Now, remember, Balaam did not see the angel of the Lord. And once again, can I point it out that in the Hebrew, the word angel is malach. And it simply means a messenger. Malach, a messenger. And uh, from, for example, the prophet Malachi is from the word Malach. And the word Malachi, the name Malachi, the prophet Malachi means my messenger. Okay, Malach is a messenger. And uh, uh, sometimes Yeshua in the Old Testament, in the Tanakh, he is the Malach Adonai. He is the messenger of the Lord. So it can be a human or it can be a, a divine super angel from the heavens or it can be the Lord himself. So the donkey saw the angel of the Lord standing in the way with his drawn sword in his hand. And the donkey turned aside out of the way and went into the field. So Balaam struck the donkey to turn her back onto the road. Then, and by the way, when he struck him, he probably struck him out of frustration and anger, right? Verse 24. Then the angel of the Lord stood in a narrow path between the vineyards with a wall on this side and a wall on that side. And when the donkey saw the angel of the Lord, she pushed herself against the wall and crushed Balaam's foot against the wall. So he struck her again. Then the angel of the Lord went further and stood in a narrow place where there was no way to turn either to the right hand or to the left. How frustrating. This is all a setup, everyone. God, God was using this donkey. And verse 27, and when the donkey saw the angel of the Lord, she lay down under Balaam. So Balaam's anger was aroused and he struck the donkey with his staff. Then the Lord opened the mouth of the donkey. And she said to Balaam, what have I done to you that you have struck me these three times? And Balaam said to the donkey, because you've abused me, poor, poor me, you know, poor victim me, because you've abused me, I wish there were a sword in my hand for now I would kill you. And look what the donkey said to Balaam. Talk about shame. Talk about a comeback. Am I not your donkey on which you have ridden ever since I became yours to this day? Was I ever disposed to do this to you? You know, in other words, I've been your friend, Balaam. I've carried you all this year and you want to kill me? Have I, have I, you know, have I ever done anything bad? And Balaam said, no. Then guys, look at verse 31. Then the Lord opened Balaam's eyes and he saw the angel of the Lord standing in the way with his drawn sword in his hand. And he bowed his head and fell flat on his face. And the angel of the Lord said to him, why have you struck your donkey these three times? Behold, I have come out to stand against you because your way is perverse before me. The donkey saw me and turned aside from me these three times. If she had not turned aside from me, surely I would also have killed you by now and let her live. And Balaam said to the angel of the Lord, I have sinned, for I did not know you stood in the way against me. Now, therefore, if it displeases you, I will turn back. Then the angel of the Lord said to Balaam, no, go with the men. He doesn't tell him to go back. He actually just wants to deal with the perverse attitude. Go with the men, but only the word that I speak to you, that you shall speak. So Balaam went with the princes of Balak. Guys, this is a beautiful picture of discipleship, isn't it? I mean, Balaam, he's human, just like you and I. Um, and, you know, he knew the Lord. He walked with the Lord. He talked with the Lord. The Lord spoke to him. He spoke to the Lord. I, I really I uh, esteem this guy, ba Balaam. Uh, he, yeah, he made a mistake. He got seduced. He got, he screwed up, but he sinned. He repented. He, he, he turned back to the Lord. And then in chapter 23, verse five, look what it says. 
Then the Lord put a word in Balaam's mouth and said, return to Balak and thus you shall speak. So he returned to him. And there he was standing by his burnt offering, he and all the princes of Moab. And he took up this oracle and said, Balak, the king of Moab, has brought me from Aram, from the mountains of Eve. Come curse Jacob for me and come denounce Israel. How shall I curse whom God has not cursed? And how shall I denounce whom the Lord has not denounced? And then he goes into this beautiful poetry, everyone. For from the top of the rocks, I see him. And from the hills, I behold him. And now he's talking about Israel. There are people dwelling alone, not reckoning itself among the nations. Who can count the dust of Jacob or number one fourth of Israel? Let me die the death of the righteous and let my end be like his. Guys, this is a beautiful oracle that comes from Balaam. And I want to draw your attention to verse nine, where he says, and from the hills I beheld him, there are people dwelling alone, not reckoning itself among the nations. Do you know famous books have been written based on this verse? Israel dwelling alone, not reckoning itself among the nations. And it's an interesting question. What does it mean? Israel dwelling alone. Because one of the first, actually the first thing in the Bible that we read that God actually says negative is that it's not good for man to be alone. And yet here he's actually sanctifying Israel to be alone. And uh, there's differences of opinion on this. Is it part of Israel's call to be separated? Yes, that's what the word holy means, to be separated unto God. There's all these different nations. Israel, you are holy. You are sanctified. You are separated. So that's part of the call of Israel, to be separated. And, um, but, you know, to what, to what degree is Israel to be alone? Because her call, we read it from Abraham's call, through you, all the nations will be blessed. So we've got to be, you know what they say, be, be in the world, but not of the world. And Israel was called to be a light to the nation. So she had to somewhat mix and touch the nation surrounding. So this is, a, this is the friction that you and I deal with, I think, every day. We're in the world, but how much of the world? We're to be separate. 2 Corinthians says, come out from among them and be ye separate says the Lord, and I will be a God to you. So we are called to be separate, and yet we're also called to be the salt and the light. So a uh, something that we have to wrestle with. And, um, and like Balaam, you know, we need to know, God, when can I go and when can I not go? What can I speak and what can I not speak? You know, at, at one moment, God said to Balaam, don't go. Next minute, he said, go. But Balaam went with the wrong motives. This is our discipleship. We got to know, God, when is it okay for me to go? You know, I might be strong enough to go with my sports team to a pub after a game for a drink, a, a beer or two. But I might be going through a difficult time, the season of my life. I might not be strong enough. I might do things wrong. There are leaders that recently have come out. I know personally of a pastor from a very senior church, I'm not gonna say where, um, he went to a bar and he had too many drinks and he got in trouble. He got, he basically got fired from big church. He, he, he you know, and I, actually it wasn't a one-off thing. He would go kind of regularly and it became more and more regular. So anyway, um, Israel, a people dwelling alone, not reckoning, not reckoning itself among the nations. Now, verse 11. Then Balak said to Balaam, what have you done to me? Notice how he takes it so personally. 
I took you to curse my enemies and look, you have blessed them bountifully. So he answered and said, must I not take heed to speak what the Lord has put in my mouth? Man, I like this guy, Balaam. He's answering, he's, you know, answering everything right. So he brings up a second oracle. Then he took up this oracle, and this is verse 18, and said, rise up, Balak, and hear. Okay, so this oracle is to Balak. He's preaching to the king of Moab here. Listen to me, son of Tipor. God is not a man that he should lie, nor the son, nor a son of man that he should repent. Has he said, and will he not do? Has he spoken? Will he not make it good? Behold, I have received the command to bless. He is blessed, and I cannot reverse it. Now, guys, look what Balaam says about Israel. He's talking to Balak, and all of a sudden he turns and gives a death. A, he kind of defines Israel. Verse 21. Talking about God, he has not observed iniquity in Jacob, nor has he seen wickedness in Israel. The Lord his God is with him, and the shout of a king is among them. God brings him out of Egypt. He has strength like a wild ox, for there is no witchcraft or sorcery against Jacob nor any divination against Israel. It must now be said of Jacob and of Israel, oh, what God has done. Look, a people rise like a lioness and lifts itself up like a lion. It shall not lie down until it devours its prey and drinks the blood of the slain. Then Balak said to Balaam, okay, so before we get carry on, before we carry on, look at that beautiful oracle that Balaam, this revelation that Balaam had of Israel. Guys, if you were Balaam and you looked down at Israel, would you say that about Jacob and Israel, that there's no witchcraft, that there's no different divination? No, you'd find their sins. You'd say they're a stiff-necked people. They're the sons of Jacob. Jacob was a deceiver. But Balaam doesn't say that. He says there's no witchcraft. There's no perverseness. He sees the complete package. He sees the is. He doesn't just see the Jacob. He sees the Israel. Remember what happened to Jacob. He was transformed into Israel. And this is the 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 the. the in other words, he gives Bal Balak no grounds for cursing Israel. And if I could paraphrase, I would be. If I was Balaam, I would say, I would say, hey, Balak. God sees nothing wrong with this group of people. He's made promises. In God's eyes, they are beautiful. They are without blemish. They're like a bride. And he's not a man that he should lie. He's not going to change his mind, Balak. So look what verse 25 says. Look at Balak's uh, response. Then Balak said to Balaam, okay, neither curse them at all, nor bless them at all. Now, stop. Look at his strategy. This is the enemy's strategy. See, guys, this is all about entering into God's inheritance. The land was the inheritance of the Israelites. This is what upset, obviously upsetting Balak. And this is why he wanted them. He wanted them out. So he changes his strategy. He says, okay, all right, we won't, we won't curse, all right? Leave out the curse. Bless them either, okay? Notice how he changes the strategy. But verse 26, Balaam comes back and said, did I not tell you, saying, all that the Lord speaks, that I must do? Now the third oracle, everyone, chapter 24. Now when Balaam saw or was convinced that it pleased the Lord to bless Israel, he did not go at other times. Guys, now Balaam is the real deal. Balaam is through dealing with the devil, with Balak. He's tried to be seduced. It's almost like Jesus at the end of the 40 days of being tempted by the devil. Remember it says the devil departed until another opportunity. And it's almost like Balaam, he split. He, it says he did not go out as at other times to seek to use sorcery, but he set his face toward the wilderness. So Balaam, you know, uh, 
he passed the test. Bit of a bumpy road there. But look at verse 2. And Balaam raised his eyes and saw Israel encamped according to their tribe. And the Spirit of God came upon him. And he took up this oracle and said, The utterance of Balaam, the son of Beor, the utterance of the man whose eyes are open. Isn't that beautiful? His eyes are open now. Clearly open. The utterance of him who hears the words of, of God, who sees the vision of the Almighty, who falls down with his eyes wide open. Guys, let's just stop for a second. Where did Balaam get this from? Where did he get this ability from? Obviously, the, the Lord, the Almighty, he appeared to him. He revealed himself. He gave him this revelation. And what it says, he says, uh, his eyes were open, verse 3. Number 4, he hears the words of God, who sees the vision of the Almighty, and who falls down with eyes wide open. This, this guy, was a, he was a real man of God. Verse 5, look what he says. And by the way, this verse in Hebrew is what the Jewish people, every time they go and pray and go into the synagogue, uh, how lovely are your tents, O Jacob, your dwellings, O Israel, like valleys that stretch out, like gardens by the riverside, like aloes planted by the Lord, like cedars beside the waters. And we know all about cedars, John, when we go up on the border by, by, uh, by Lebanon, we see those beautiful cedars. Verse 7, he shall pour water from his buckets, and his seed shall be in many waters. His king shall be higher than Agag, and his kingdom shall be exalted. God brings him out of Egypt. He is strength like a wild ox. He shall consume the nations, his enemies. He shall break it. By the way, by the way, everyone, he shall consume the nations, his enemies. What does that remind us of? Do you remember when Abraham was tested by offering up his son, Isaac? God called, this is another curveball from God. He tells Isaac to absolutely destroy all the promises of God on Mount Moriah. I want you to destroy every one of the promises I've given you by killing your son. And Abraham was ready. And then the angel of the Lord said, Abraham, now I know you fear me, and in blessing I will bless you, in cursing, uh, sorry, in blessing I will bless you, and in multiply, I will multiply your seed. And then he said, you shall possess the gates of your enemies. What he says, and look what it says here in verse 8. He shall consume the nations, his enemies. He shall break their bones and pierce them with arrows. And I just wonder whether some of these oracles, as they came out, it was remember, it was by the Spirit of God, that he didn't have in mind the promises given to Abraham. Verse 9, he bows down, he la lies down as a lion, and as a lion, who shall rouse him? Blessed is he who blesses you, and cursed is he who curses you. Going back to the promise of Abraham. Now look at the enemy, and I'm going to call Balak the enemy. Look at his response. Then Balak's anger was aroused against Balaam, and he struck his hands together. And Balak said to Balaam, I called you to curse my enemies, and look, you have bountifully blessed them these three times. Now, therefore, flee to your place. I said I would greatly honor you, but in fact, the Lord has kept you back from honor, which is a twist, total twist, a lie. So Balaam said to Balak, did I not also speak to your messengers, whom you sent to me, saying, if Balak were to give me his house full of silver and gold, I could not go beyond the word of the Lord to do good or bad of my own will. What the Lord says, that I must speak. And now indeed, I am going to my people. Come, I will advise you what this people will do to your people in the last days. Uh-oh. Now Balaam is saying, I've got a few more words for you, Balak. What my people, you notice, he, I think he says, yeah. He says, um, he, now he's identified with the Jewish people. Look at verse 14. And now indeed, I'm going to my people. Come, I will advise you what this people will do to your people in the latter days. So Balaam's fourth prophecy. So he, uh, verse 15, 
So he took up this oracle and said, the utterance of Balaam, and by the way, I'm not reading all the verses. I just cut out a few verses. The utterance of Balaam, the son of Beor, and the utterance of the man whose eyes are open, the utterance of him who hears the words of God and has the knowledge of the Most High, who sees the vision of the Almighty, who falls down with his wide, eyes wide open. I see him, but not now. I behold him, but not near. A star shall come out of Jacob, and a scepter shall rise out of Israel, and batter the brow of Moab, and destroy all the sons of the mold. A beautiful messianic prophecy, everyone. Talking about the desire of all nations. The seed of Abraham, the promise where God said, through you, Abraham, all the nations shall be blessed. I love the story how Balaam, he wasn't perfect. He had, he was being corrected. He was being discipled by the Lord and he repented. He got it right. He, he had his motives exposed. And by the way, there's an interesting parallel I, that I, as I was preparing, you know who I was thinking of? Peter, because if you notice, three times the donkey moved to the side, went to the side, crouched down. Three times he hit him. Remember what happened with Peter? Three times he denied the Lord. Notice how God used an animal to speak to Balaam, and notice how God used an animal to speak to Peter. Three times the rooster will crow. I just think that's a really interesting parallel. Notice how Balaam, one minute he was God's rock. Next minute, he was a stumbling block. Get behind me, Satan. Notice how Balaam, one minute, he, God said go. The next minute, he was angry. He was angry. I just think it's really interesting. But Balaam got it right. And then God said go. and he went and he spoke the word of the lord the spirit of god came upon him and guys the message is that god's love is unchanging nothing can separate us from the love of god and it doesn't matter what enemy what strategy what curse may try to come against us generational spoken word witch doctor it doesn't matter because God's blessing is over his people. And we are his people. We remain under not only the Abrahamic blessing. We remain under the, the Aaronic blessing. We, we covered that a couple of months ago. We are under Yeshua's blessing. In John 17, his high priestly blessing. And we remain under his blessing. And guys, in the same way that the donkey was struck three times, we know someone was struck three times. That donkey was actually sent to help Balaam, to carry Balaam. He was a helper. And Balaam struck him. He treated him as an enemy. And the Jewish people, they crucified him. He came to save them. They actually said, Hosanna, save us. And then the next day, they said, crucify him. And that's because, everyone, their eyes were closed. There was a veil over their eyes, just like the veil over Balaam's eyes. But his eyes were open. And this is what we need to pray for the Jewish people, that their eyes will be open. And they will look upon him whom they have struck or pierced. In chapter 22, verse 31, then the Lord opened the eyes of Balaam and he saw the angel of the Lord standing in the way and a sword drawn in his hand and he bowed down his head and fell face. And guys, as we think of Israel today, as we think of the church, how do we look at them? Are we like Balak where we're always trying to find fault and we speak negatively, we speak words of curse? Or are we like Balaam, who looked out and said, Ma tovu ohalecha Yaakov, u mishkonotecha Yisrael. How goodly are your tents, O Jacob. 
and your tabernacles, O Israel. I'm not saying that we need to turn a blind eye to everything. I'm just saying we need to know that we're all a work in progress. We are all like Balaam. We are all like Peter. We are in the process of being disciples. But God's love, God's faithfulness is over our lives. And may we take up that same attitude. May our eyes be opened to the fact that really we should be cursed for our sins. But Yeshua, it says in Galatians 3.13, he became a curse for us that we might receive the blessing. May we look at others in the same way and be careful with our judging. And may we bask and dwell in God's unchanging love and not be afraid of anything, any curse, any leader, any ruler that rises up and calls upon the greatest diviners in the world to curse. We don't need to be afraid. God's perfect love drives out fear. And if we have the knowledge of God, like Balaam, that his love is deep, that remember what he said, don't curse because I have blessed. God's blessing is over each one of our, our lives. And may we remain under it and not let any lies of the any enemy in. Hallelujah. Amen. Wow, great teaching. So many facets to that story. <laughs> I know. <laughs> it was a challenge uh, preparing it, but it was fun also. I learned yeah. a lot. And if I missed it, what, what did you say Balaam's background was? Because in verse 18, he says, the Lord, my God, but he wasn't Israelite. So what was he? Do we know? Uh, uh, not that I um, that I found in, as I was preparing, but he was not an Israelite. He was not from the people of Israel. Yeah. He joined in, obviously, but he had knowledge of the Most High. Wow. So uh, not sure where he, he came from. Maybe someone can find that out. Don't know. But like I said, the, the Jewish tradition is that he was one of uh, the advisors of Pharaoh. Maybe he was a Midianite. I don't know. Uh, maybe he was an Egyptian. Gina, did you have something? Yeah, no, I had, I, I did some look up quickly to find out who, who okay. Ben was. <laughs> um, so he, he was from, was it Pethor or Pethor, a city on, by the Euphrates, they speculate. So he's from those locations, Gentile regions, basically. And from what I'm reading, he was, basically one that was renowned for denouncing God. So they commissioned him to curse Israel. It's like he's known for it. And what's hilarious here is that it, it reminded me, this just a tangent thing here. I don't know if you, anybody's ever seen it, but there was a movie that came out in 1997 called Liar Liar with Jim Carrey. And his little boy prayed that for like one day, his father would tell only the truth, no matter what. And so Jim Carrey being a lawyer, mm -hmm. you know, he's, he's getting up there and he's ready to tell these big old place inaccuracies, lies. And instead he says all truths, everything, including comments about people's appearances. And of course it gets him in trouble because nobody's expecting that, but that's kind of what it reminded me of. So Balaam's over there going to start cursing israel and of course he just spews out blessings and everybody's jaw drops right they're like what that's not what we agreed on so that's kind of what it reminded me of but i uh, from these stories like this i know they are serious but at the same time you see god's sense of humor in it just just as i mentioned to you the other the other thing about god's sense of humor there's other stories that just make me chuckle like that that the, the human nature and, and our and our silliness is um, I don't know if you remember in the New Testament in Acts chapter 20, when Paul is preaching, they're in like an, uh, an upstairs room or something where there's distance from the ground. And there's a man sitting on the windowsill called Eutychus. 
and Paul is going on and on. We know this. It's kind of like a long, drawn out message. And poor little Eutychus, he falls asleep. He falls out of the window and he dies. And so Paul, this is what's funny. Paul sees this. His jaw drops to the floor. And Paul runs downstairs and he heals the guy. And he says, okay. Let's get back upstairs and says, okay, where'd I leave off? <laughs> it's yep. just things like that, that, that help enforce God's word. You know, he's not all thunder and, and anger. He, he loves us and he wants us to have joy and, and find the humor in things, but also learn from his stories. The other thing about this story, it reminds me of Melchizedek. You know, Balaam, it's not like he's a priest, almost of the same level as Melchizedek. Yeah, nobody, knew, nobody knows where he came from. Right. I was interested in Aaron's um, comments about God using Satan. And if you if you read Job, Job comments in uh, chapter 23, verse 10, he knows the way I take. When he has tried me, I shall come forth as gold. And it made me think that God uses Satan as his crucible. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, I would agree with that. Thank you. We so just don't like the temperature going up. Oh, I'm sorry. Go on, go on. I was just going to ask what happened to the elders of Midian. They just disappear in the story after verse 7. So they call on the princes of Moab and the elders of Midian, and they go to uh, Balaam, and then all of a sudden, they're gone. Well, the only thing that I can think of, and it's I could be reading into it or speculating, that uh, we all know who the, the priest of Midian was, and that was Jethro. Mm -hmm. And Jethro was the father-in-law of Moshe, of Moses. And Moses was the deliverer. And so, obviously, Jethro, at some stage, would have probably heard about what Moses did and who these Israelite people were and are. And maybe the fear of God came upon them. Maybe they, their eyes were open. Uh, to common sense and say, no, we don't want to mess with these people. I don't know. That's the only thing that comes to me. Because it was interesting in verse seven, it says they departed with the diviner's fee and came to Balaam and spoke to him. But then all of a sudden, it's just the princes that he invites to, to stay with them. So they probably, you're right, changed their mind, but for some reason. Or maybe they did a runner they had the money the fee and they ran i don't know <laughs> these kinds of things happen <laughs> um this is audrey and this is story is is so fascinating and like dd said so many facets to it and but when i when the when the donkey is speaking to balaam i always get the names mixed up um it, it almost sounds like, and I don't want to compare with Christ, but it's like the angel of the Lord is, is speaking through him. And it's like Christ speaking to the, <clears throat> to the Jews when he was being, I don't know if it was when, when he was being tried. And he said, you know, I have, haven't I spoken to you all this mm. time in the open, mm. you've heard me, what have I done that you would mm. want to strike me? And, you know, it's, it's the mm. three times. And, and, and Balaam is like the Jewish people representation. You know, I know this is now it's, mm. I don't want to allegorize too much, but, you know, it's like you, 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 you're striking me. Why are you striking? I've been open with you. What have I done that has, you know, that's so bad that you're egregious that you've struck me and the other thing is that if you notice on donkeys they have on their withers a cross a formation of a cross on the top of their withers and 
I learned that a few years ago and that I just was like, that's to me, it's amazing. Jesus came in on a donkey and it, it shows the cross right there. I, I, you know, I, you know, and it's like in the wilderness when they're the, the tribes are all walking. And if you look from above, it forms a cross, right? When they're with <laughs> Moses and the tribes yeah. this way, this way, this way. It, 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 you know, not that they could see it, but anyway, that it's, it's, and then, and then it's like a foretelling of the future. And then Israel, Balaam's eyes were open. It's like they're, they have a veil over them now, but then, the, then it will be removed and their eyes will be open to who their Messiah is, Yeshua HaMashiach. Amen. Yeah. And, wow, Audrey, I love your train of thought. I think it's <laughs> amazing. And uh, I think, uh, you know, I can't remember if it was last week or the week before, but I mentioned that there's a, a well-known rabbi in Israel. He's originally from France, uh, well-respected in the religious uh, uh, world. He wants to reopen the case against Yeshua, against Jesus, found oh, I read that. Uh, yeah. in the New Testament, and because he actually believes that he was wrongly tried. And um, uh, it just made me think of that, as you were saying, because, yeah, uh, um, the donkey was wrongly struck. He shouldn't have been struck. He didn't do anything wrong. The complete opposite. He and, and Joseph. In the, in the Old Testament, in the Tanakh. Joseph was, was rejected wrongly. Yeah. Uh, and these are all, you know, uh, prototypes of the Messiah. And by the way, and, and again, going, about, going on to what you were saying about the donkey, I didn't know about the cross. It's quite interesting. But uh, a donkey is actually a, a very royal animal. Not just yeah. Yeshua, but... Many, many kings in the ancient Near Eastern world, they would come in on a processional march riding on a donkey. So it's a very royal animal, a very humble, as it says in Zechariah 9, 9, behold, thy king cometh humble riding on a donkey. Um, so it's just interesting, you know, scripture, interpreting scripture, tying the, the, the pieces together. It is fascinating. It is. Yeah. Thank you. And I don't want to read too much into it, but you know, there it's no like the other. No, no, no. It. <laughs> no, I don't think so. I think, I think there's room for, a, for opinion. And, uh, and sometimes we do, we do stretch it, but sometimes we don't. Sometimes it kind of, it fits. Yeah, and and I, I appreciate good. what you shared. Yeah. Now I'm going to, now I'm going to jump in. This is Chet. Hey, Chet. Hi. Hi. I love, I'm, I'm thinking about that scene where the angel says, says to um, Balaam, it, but for the donkey, you would already be dead. I, I would have killed you and spared the donkey. Yeah. I, I can read into says? that. Oh, is that what he says? I think so. He does. Okay. Yeah. yeah. But for me who saved you. Yeah, that donkey, in a way, was Balaam's savior. <laughs> See, there you go. Christ is our savior. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. If they really did open that trial up, that should be so easy to prove because there's so many documented um, laws that they broke that night. Like the Sanhedrin, the original Sanhedrin, wasn't even in place it was the corrupt you know Caiaphas Annas and all of his relatives that had bought their position on the Sanhedrin they, they had the trial in the middle of the night at the priest's home not where they were supposed to have it and he's supposed to vote last to not influence the vote but he voted first yeah. and the high priest isn't supposed to tear his robe but he tore his robe and there's several other things that were, well, most of the Pharisees weren't there, like Nicodemus, Paul wasn't there, several others. That, there might have been some of the uh, ones that leaned more towards the Sadducees, and they say they were really strict on criminals. Um, so anyway, that'll be interesting. If you hear more about that, 
definitely share that with us. Mm, yes, definitely I will. There's a small book that I read with our Bible study years ago, The Case for Easter and the Resurrection by Lee Strobel. His story was that he was a, basically a, an, an atheist or an agnostic journalist, and then he started researching and, and studying up Jesus, and he wrote this book on his evidence that he found. So it's just a small, quick read, but there's so much, there is so much evidence that he found as a journalist. So. <laughs> It, it, interesting to me too, as, as while I'm thinking about it, is that God would send two separate kinds of angels, right? He'd send those that would say, do not fear, do not be afraid. And then there's others in a few times where God revealed himself um, through his, his angels, like in uh, when he revealed himself to Abimelech, the king of uh, Gerar in Abraham's time, like in Genesis 20. Mm -hmm. And then he revealed himself to Pharaoh in dreams in Genesis 41. And then um, Nebuchadnezzar himself in, in Daniel. So uh, Daniel chapter four. So those were the times when he revealed himself to, to them, the enemies, trying to, I guess, dissuade mm. them and, and tell them this is how it's going to be. <laughs> mm. Yeah. And there's an, the, an element too, when the angel appears with a drawn sword, that there's a there's there's a destruction there's a destructive side to the angel of the Lord at times as well that he wants to actually destroy um, when David sinned and and the angel had a sword over Jerusalem and um, and uh, and this time as well so it's almost like it reminds me of the the sword in the Garden of Eden over the um, the tree of there was flames and a sword, I believe, over the, the tree of life to guard it, to guard the tree of life. I don't know. Anyway. Now, there's so many wonderful stories like that. Like, remember Nathan that had to go to David and tell him, you know, the story about the man with the one sheep and how he was just like that man. And then, well, even Joseph, he had to tell prophetic things about the seven years of famine mm. and, you know and also about the what the baker and <laughs> the one that was going to yes. be hung and <laughs> yeah. that's right well praise the lord yeah. um, let me turn my camera around to show you um yeah. Standing up, there is uh, the Mediterranean. There is Tel Aviv in the distance. And um, I'm just on the overview, if some of you can recognize. This is the, the view of, from Jaffa over, over Tel Aviv. And then down there is part of the remains of the ancient port where, uh, where Jonah ran away. And... Um, and of course, this is the place where Peter had, uh, had his uh, lunch. And then after lunch, he had the vision of the sheet of animals. And then the Lord said, arise, slay and eat. And what God has clean, cleansed, do not call unclean. And um, the parallel that uh, Jesus, Yeshua twice called Peter, Simon, son of Jonah, and it was just no mistake that it was here in Joppa that the Lord turns to Peter, a fisherman who would have known all the story about Jonah. And of course, Jonah, he ran away here because he didn't want to take the message of grace to the Gentiles. And here the Lord chooses Peter, a fisherman, the son of Jonah, to take the gospel to the Gentiles. So it's a good reminder of uh, God's universal plan of salvation, not just for the Israelites, but for the Jews, uh, for the Gentiles as well. And of course, today we see that. We see this guy, Balaam, who has this deep uh, personal relationship with the Lord. You know, he, to me, and in some ways, he's a real model disciple, the way he he learned from his mistake. He, he was convicted. 
and he um, his eyes were open and he repented and then he went uh, and walked the, the the good walk walking in the light and uh, here's by the way here's a church this is saint peter's church this is to honor peter uh who was here in joppa and that's a catholic church and um i've got a couple of hours to spare so i think i'm going to go in and to the confessional and confess all my sins but uh no i'm joking just two hours <laughs> just two hours no, not enough. Hello. <laughs> i need a few more i know <laughs> i'm teasing <laughs> well does anybody have anything else if not, thank you so much for taking us outside in yeah, Israel today. Welcome. That that was a real treat. We know very it's welcome. hot and Fun. Quite, quite a sacrifice. Yeah. <laughs> so if you no, want to no, close us fine. in very prayer, good. that'd be great. Yeah. Yeah, let's pray, everyone. Hallelujah. Father God, just thank you for our time. Thank you for uh, speaking to Balaam and correcting him and leading him in the right path. And Lord, we pray that uh, we would learn from this and, uh, and our motives would be, uh, would be um, challenged as well. And we would challenge our own motives. Mm. And, uh, and Lord, the things that cause you to anger, Lord, may we uh, repent and 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 also lord we we know that your anger is only but for a moment but your loving kindness lasts forever and we praise you and we thank you lord and thank you that you have dealt with israel lord in such a faithful way that your blessing is over her and we speak blessing over the people Amen. of israel lord jews and gentiles we pray that their eyes would be open to the one that they struck, the donkey, the humble one, the, the, the Savior, Yeshua. We pray, Lord, open the eyes, bring salvation to Jews, to Muslims, to Gentiles. Lord, I pray your blessing on everyone who is with us here. Lord, your blessing uh, of, of Abraham, of, uh, of Yeshua. Your blessing will be upon them. And so I pray, Yivarechacha Adonai Vishmarecha. Yah Ea Adonai Panavalecha Vihonecha. Isa Adonai Panavalecha. Yasimlacha Shalom. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you. Be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up the light of his countenance upon you and give you shalom. Peace in the name of Prince of Peace. Amen. 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 And, I, and I'm not. And I'm not going to try. I'm not going to try and do what Gary does every week with his Hebrew. He's a. He's a bit of a master at that. So I'll hand it over to you. Dee. <laughs>